we're going to talk about Git. And this is to do with version control, protecting your code, working as a team. But these are all things that uh, involve using something called Git, which is about storing your, your code safely somewhere. So we should start by thinking with what is Git for? Because there's a range of things it could be used for. Uh, companies use Git to manage code across loads of people. You can use Git for like a remote storage to keep it safe so it's not on your laptop, which we'll talk about. You can use it for versions of your software. But really, in all of those cases, what I see Git as being for is for protection. Git protects your code from yourself, uh, from other versions messing it up, or from other people messing up your good code when they're collaborating with you. So really, Git is a way to protect code and make it safe. And you should be using it for yourself. You should be using it when you work with others. And you should be using it on projects that matter or just on anything when you might want to go back to something. I've heard of GitHub. And obviously, loads of people will be shouting at the screen right now. Of course, GitHub, GitHub. But is there a difference between Git and GitHub? Well, so GitHub is a online server like set of repositories where you can store your Git projects remotely. So that's a great, GitHub is a great example uh, website where you can basically choose to push your code remotely so it's not on your computer, so it's safe. But there's other ones as well. There's like GitLab is another one which you can use. And companies can also set up internal servers with instances of GitLab, for example. And that means that you can have one just within your company uh, where you push to a different computer in your company. Uh, you could even, if you wanted to, have your own <laughs> GitLab server somewhere else on a different computer in your house. So, so GitHub is just a, uh, one of the companies providing Git as a service. Yeah, I feel like they're sort of saying, we're a hub of Git projects, you know, we're, we're like a place where you can store it. Um, but the, you, they also provide lots of other features which could be handy. So those features typically are the ones that help teams to collaborate. Uh, so they've spent a long time adding features around Git as a storage protocol, um, basically to encourage teams to use it. The other thing some people might have heard of is something like SVN, which is another type of system which is storing versions of your code, but we're going to basically not talk about those differences here. They're basically doing the same thing, different ways slightly, but we're really talking about how do you use Git to protect yourself rather than exactly how Git works. Yeah, we should start by thinking about using Git for yourself when you want to use Git to look after your own code to make sure you don't accidentally break your code. Because I'm sure loads of you, like me, have got to a point where you've been working on a project for a while and suddenly nothing works. And you didn't spot exactly when you broke everything, but you've made quite a few changes since you last knew that it did work. Um, so anybody that is carefully looking after their code is going to be thinking, oh, okay, every time I do something good, make something work, I'm going to uh, store it as a period of time in my Git repository so I can always roll back to it. That's like the main function where you can use Git for yourself. You're like protecting previous working stages of your code that you can always go back to. So sort of save as you go sort of thing. Yeah, save as you go version history is really useful. But to get there, you have to do a few things. Uh, so for a start, we're presuming you're working in like a folder on your computer. And that folder is like a, just a normal file storage and you've got some files in there. And Git is doing nothing with that until you ask it to start doing something. And then when you want it to do something, you say, OK, uh, Git init, which basically in this initializes Git in that folder, presuming you've got Git installed on your computer already, which you know most Linux-based systems have. Um, and then what that does is it creates a little hidden folder. So you could do this by showing the contents of your folder, including hidden files, which is ls minus a on a Mac, for example. Uh, on a Linux machine. And that will show you that there is a new folder now in your folder, which is called .git. And it's sort of hidden there, doing a series of jobs that you don't know that's happening. It's kind of, I see it as like a magic folder that is looking after all your code for you. And you could go into a, a whole video at some point where you look into how that .git folder works. But it's essentially storing histories of everything you're doing in that folder from now on. But it's not quite ready at that point. You then have to do something else where you say, OK, um, I've got some files here. I want to tell Git to manage them. So what you do then is a git add and then the name of the file that you want to put in. And then from that point, Git's like, OK, I know about that file now. And from now on, I will always look at it. And I'll track its status. I won't do anything unless you tell me to, but I'll know it's there. So you could, it means what you can have is some files that Git never knows about, never looks at, and some files that Git is in charge of. And that's really handy, for example, uh, if you need to have like your own personal access token to a server, you have that as something that Git doesn't manage, only stays on your computer. And then your other people working on that same project have their own ones that Git never manages. But then you ask Git only to manage the files that you think are important. I always consider Git being like the sort of robot that is managing your files on the side, keeping records of them, updating them if you ask it to. It's basically your, your little servant robots 
keeping versions of your file safe when you ask it to. So then what you have is this special area that Git knows about, an area that Git doesn't know about, and then a stage in between, which is the staged area, which we're going to also talk about. So maybe it's handy to look at the, uh, at the example folder I've got here on the iPad. So this is, mm -hmm. if we ex expect that the white area on the iPad is a folder, and when you do git init, what happens is it creates basically three sections of that folder, is the way I look at it. A section that it does not care about, which would be here on the left. Um, so let's say, um, call this normal. And then a git area that git is in charge of. So we'll put this over here as the git area. Git's area is bigger. Is that just uh, so you can draw? Yeah, That's more space for me to store stuff in this demo. <laughs> And then there's a staged area. So we'll call this staged. So what happens is uh, when you first create a file, you create a file in there and make my files green, just represent as a box and I'll call that version one. At this point, Git doesn't know anything about that because you haven't told it about it. So to get Git to know about it, what you have to do is type in git add file one or the green file. And what that does is it says, okay, from now on, I'll put this in an area that Git knows about. At least it's begun to see about. It's not in Git's history yet, but Git knows about it there. If I had another file, Git wouldn't know anything about that and I could play with Git as much as I want and Git will never touch it. So you have to do this Git add and then file name to make Git start to play with it. So then when you've uh, got maybe a couple of files in there and you want uh, Git to store that as a point in time, what you then say is Git commit. And if you do that, what it'll do is it'll take all the files that are in the staged area, which is all of these now, and it will put that into its history or start to put it into its history what it will first do is it'll say, please, can you type in a message to describe this point in history? So it will pop up an editor, uh, which you can configure to whichever editor you want. Um, but it will pop up that editor and it will, you just type in essentially a message that represents the current state. And there's all sorts of advice on what that should be. Companies have policies on what that message should be for every state that you decide to save. Um, but for yourself, it could be whatever you find helpful. But then when you save that message, it then moves everything over into the history and then puts the message as like a little label up here and then gives it like a special ID, a hash code reference essentially for that point in time. So the files you see, because that's the most recent one, uh, the files you see in your folder are going to look at those files there, but you can start to make changes. So then what you can do is you can say, oh, I want to add to the second file. This is where it starts to get complicated. So I want to make an, an update to file two and you're working on that, on this area, which has not, not been told to by Git yet. Git sort of knows it's there. Let's do point 0.1, there we go. Okay, so then to get Git to store that for you, you have to say, okay, I've made a change to a file and these are files I want to store in the next history point. So you then say Git add, and it will take this and put it back into the staging area. Because you said, I want to add this to the next point in history that I'm going to store. And so now when you say Git commit, it's going to commit again, the things that are in the staged area. So then you type in git commit, it says, okay, do you want, uh, to, you need to add a message to that again. So it pops up the editor, you add a message. Uh, and then once you've added that and closed it, uh, you, it then moves that into the next version of history. So how this looks is you'll have mm -hmm. this here, you'll have another message you put in there like that. And you've now got two stages of history inside Git. So what this means is you can actually access any of those stages in history again, if you want to. So there's a few interesting things you can do. Um, but if you ever want to see what your history is, you can first type in git log and that shows you, and we've got a separate view for this, that shows you a kind of history of all the things that you've done. So you can go back to any of those times in the past. So what you need to do is you need like to- Like a list of those messages, is it? Yeah, so these, this is like a list history of the stages that you've saved of messages. So these are the messages I put in, like hello for the very first one, made a new change for the second one, and then new file. So you're basically asking for one of those stages in history back. So what you can always do, and it will warn you if you do this, but you can do it if you need to, you can say git checkout, and then the code that you got for this special item in history, the kind of hash reference. And then what it will do is it will take that point in history and bring it back to being the current files that you see. And then you could read from there, what did I do? Um, where, where was I? You could potentially take some copies of files if you want to store them somewhere else. Uh, and then you can go back to the current point in history by checking out the code of the most recent one instead. So what that's doing is it's changing the files that are in your folder. So your folder no longer is like a view of your current files. Your folder is now a view of files in a state of history, which might be the most recent state, but it could be any state in this history. 
is it literally like Git is kind of pas pasting those into your normal view so you can see them, but it saves all the rest of it? Yeah, one really fun exercise actually is to make a file, save it to the Git history using Git commit, make a file, add it to the Git history, make a file, add it to the Git history, and then just have a view of that folder open on your screen, and then in the terminal, check out each of the stages of history. And you'll see it just adding the files and taking them away and adding the files and taking them away. And that's a really kind of clear way to see that you are um, switching between stages of history and your view of your folder is always a view of a stage of history that Git is managing. And you're just choosing which stage of history you want to view. One of the problems with checking out previous old versions of your history is that you can't really work on those and switch back very easily. So one thing they always recommend is you can create something called a Git branch. Now to make this confusing, you're turning your history, which was linear until this point, into a history that has a branching point that you can switch between, uh, which maybe we don't need to worry too much about. But you can essentially say, um, so the first thing you can do is you type in Git branch, and that will list all the branches you currently have. And that will probably just be, until you've done something complicated, that will probably just be the master branch. Um, which is the one that nearly everyone works on by default because they haven't made a policy for anything else. Companies don't let you tend to do that, but most people are just working their own projects on the master. But say you wanted to get a copy from your history um, but not disrupt your master branch. What you can say is um, git branch, give it a branch name, like uh, when it used to work. <laughs> it could be the name, you know, whatever you want it to be. <laughs> and then you can, um, and then give it the code of that point in history, the hash code from that point in history. And then what it will do is it create a branch from that point in history to the side that's called when it used to work. Uh, and then you can git check out when it used to work. And that will switch you to the point of when it used to work. And now all your files will show what's on that branch, which is a point in time when it used to work. But you can just switch branch back to your master. So this is kind of an easier, safer way to go back to a point in history and see where things were. It's just by putting that point of history into a branch. So that's all well and good if I'm trying to manage what I'm doing, but I'm I'm guess this gets used across organisations with multiple people and things, does it? Yeah, so that's kind of challenging. And one of the things Git will do, which we can talk about in another video in the future, is uh, it will always tell you when you've edited code that someone else has edited. And so this is a really handy feature. It protects code from other people or protects you know you from damaging other people's code that works. Because sometimes you're working on something, you make some changes, and then you think that's going to be great, and then you would, you know, commit them to the project. Um, but really, what you've done is broken something else that someone else has done, or some, someone else has edited the same file on the same day, and you both commit at the end of the day, and it's going to start, you know, conflicting. So Git will always say, "Hold on a second, you know, there are multiple changes here, and if it can do it, then Git will just merge them. You know, if, if you've changed one file, someone else has changed another file, Git will just, you know." Put them both in and say, "Hey, everything, everything was fine. You know, no conflicts there." Um, but if you both edit the same file, it will say, "Okay, before I will let you put this in, you really need to tell me the correct way to merge this because it's it needs human intelligence to merge it safely." So it will say, "Here's the bits you made. Here's the bits someone else made. Delete one or the other, or merge them. Whatever you do, and it will only accept it once you've." kind of merge those bits and removed any metadata it adds to it. So it's, it's really clever at protecting you and saying you can't do that until, <laughs> until you check out what happened. And one of my favorite exercises with students is to make all five of them try and edit the same file on the same day during the lab. And that's when they get to learn this kind of a process of, of working together and understanding other people's code changes and how you're going to affect them. How you can use GitHub is, uh, is to have like, or, or you know, or GitLab, I should, shouldn't prioritize one company, but um, you can basically use those remote servers to protect your codes in case someone steals your computer or in case you spill water on your computer or in case you delete the entire folder, which if you did, you would delete the folder and all the contents and the Git robot that was managing that code. You know, it would just all be gone. So in case of loss, what people do is they like to Git push their code to a remote server. So there's a few different ways of setting that up. One thing you can do is you can go to these websites, you can create a new project and give it a name and that's all fine. And then it will give you an address. And so what you then type on your computer is you, um, in, if you're in your folder with all the files on it, you, you type in uh, git remote add a name, which most people just use origin, uh, and then the address that you just got from that website. And then what you're saying to them is, okay, 
hey, hey, Git robot, there is now some space online that I want you to use. And every time I, I, I type in Git push, I want you to push all the changes to that remote location and it will then store it safely up there. And that's great because that means you can, if you, if you do lose your computer or say you go to visit a friend or your family and then someone messages you saying, oh no, something's really broken, you can always just uh, uh, go onto any computer that has Git right? and then say Git clone that project and it will take a copy of the project down to that new computer and then you can um, edit the files, save them, Git push and push them back up there. And then when you get home back to your normal computer, you can say, okay, Git pull and it will pull down the latest version onto your computer and update everything. So that means uh, you can work on any computer, any folder in your computer, you know, whatever you want. You can always just get the latest version from the server, work on that code and then push it back to the server and you always have a safe, a safe version away from you in the future. And then we can talk about in the, uh, another video how teams are all pushing and pulling to these remote servers and that remote server is being the place that all the code comes together for the company or the team or the project which you can get back to your computer. And now you've got a message from this first hop. Go again. Set the time to live to two. It decrements to one, decrements again, and now you can't sort of pick up each other's transmissions. Now, you've got a similar problem on the original ethernet, back when you had a shared physical piece of wire.